diri ya Abisa tiga Abisa Abisa Have you been blessed this Sabbath? Amen I've been blessed this Sabbath, I've been blessed all throughout this week to be able to spend time with you, to share the Word of God with you, to fellowship with you, to work alongside those that have given themselves over to following the Great Commission, and that is to go beyond the gates of the church and to share this everlasting gospel. It's critical that we um, realize that God is calling us to be His faithful servants at this hour. I've been a bit, how can I say? Mm. I've been asking God what it is that I should share with you this, this week. There's so much that we've discussed this week, and I know how we are as human beings. We like information, but uh, we're very uh, slow to assimilate those things which we hear. Did you hear what I said? And so we like to hear things, but assimilating them, that's a totally different story. And at times, I'd rather leave the people of God with something to masticate than to continue to put food on the plate. Does that make sense? But nonetheless, I'm going to take just a few moments to share something with you that I believe is pertinent. And I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me as we've done all throughout this week. I do invite you to kneel with me. And please, just take the next few moments. We're just going to take 60 seconds precisely. There's so much that is going on. We've heard many wonderful testimonies. I've been blessed by them. But please, take the next few moments to pray in your heart. Ask God to settle the thoughts of your mind. I know as we come closer to the close of the Sabbath, the things of this life begin to rise up in our minds, but ask God to set all of that down. Let His Spirit have full control in our hearts and in His sanctuary. When you hear my voice, I'll be closing this out in prayer. Please, let us pray and pray earnestly. Pray for yourself and please pray for me as well. Let's pray. I know that you have blessed us. Lord, you blessed us even in that you have used us to be a blessing to others. And if we have asked you for ears to hear, we have heard your voice. Father, I pray that as the Sabbath draws to a close, your spirit does not move in any diminished fashion. And so, Lord, I pray for the power of your spirit to move upon our hearts. Please make plain the testimony of your word. And I thank you for just listening to this, my simple, humble prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Once again, we're looking at Revelation, the third chapter, a familiar chapter in the Bible. To most of us here, and it should be a familiar chapter in the Bible, because this chapter in the Bible speaks directly of us. Revelation, chapter 3, and we're looking at the church of Laodicea. Once again, Revelation, the third chapter, and we're looking at the church of Laodicea, beginning at verse 14. Please me your Bible in the Bible, just say amen. amen. The Bible says, And unto the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say it, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works. 
that thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. God is totally disturbed with the condition of us as prophetic church in these last days. He says, we're neither cold or hot. We are lukewarm. There's much to be said about that. But let me just say one thing about it. We are insensitive to our condition. Do you understand that? Yeah. If something's cold, there's a sense of feeling. Something is hot, there is a sense of feeling. When something is lukewarm, we're insensitive to our condition. And that is why God is disturbed. God would rather us be holy in the world or holy be on fire for Him, but not in a condition in which we don't understand our condition. He says, you say you're rich, you say you're increased with goods, you say, we say, we have need of nothing. But the reality is, we're wretched. That's the first thing that God has to say about us, you're wretched. And I want you to see exactly what he is stating when he declares us to be wretched. Open your Bible to the book of Romans. Where are you going in your Bible now? We're going to Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans, the seventh chapter. We're looking at Romans chapter seven. And we're going to look now at verse 24 to understand simply what is it that God means when he calls us wretched. In the book of Romans chapter seven, looking at what verse? 24, the Bible says, O wretched man that I am, whom shall deliver me from what? This body of what? Talk to me. This body of this death. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that the wretched man is the man or woman that is dead in their trespasses and sins? That was the condition of the man right there in Romans chapter 7. The things that I would do, I don't do them. The things that I wouldn't do, I do them. Oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this But I find myself in bondage to sin. God says that is the condition of us as people. We're wretched. Dead in our sins. Question, how do you reason with the dead man? I think it's a relevant question. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. So how do you reason with a dead man? And you're all looking and shaking your heads. How do you? Do you realize that God is trying to reason with dead men? And he has to be able to communicate with dead men so that they can live again. How? Go with me. We're going to the book of Ezekiel. Where are you going now? Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. Once again, we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. Please pay close attention as we look into the Word of God. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning at the first verse. The Bible tells us here, the hand of the Lord was upon me. This is Ezekiel speaking. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of what? This was full of bones, and he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the midst of the there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. So the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Ezekiel, takes him, drops him in the midst of this valley, and as he looks round about in this open valley, he sees a multitude of dry bones. And they're not just dry, the Bible says they're very dry. Are you following right now? Amen. 
Now, why is that significant? I know I have a lot of healthcare professionals here, or professed so. Hammers. What's inside of bones, brothers and sisters? Come on now, talk to me. This is simple biology. This is simple anatomy and physiology. What's inside of bones? Marrow, bone marrow. What is the function of bone marrow? Produces cells, but in particular, what type of cells? Blood cells, am I correct? And white blood cells, right? Your immune system, am I correct? Yes. So inside of the bones is bone marrow, which is responsible for producing... Talk to me, come on now, talk to me. If I have to stand up here and talk, you have to talk to me. Are you with me right now? Bone marrow produces blood cells. Is, if our blood cells in bone marrow, am I, am I telling the right? Am, am I on point right now? See, I got a little bit of that. I'm on point right now. Also, white blood cells, am I correct? What does the Bible say about blood in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11? The life of the flesh is in the blood. And if the bones are very dry, then guess what? There's absolutely no life in those bones. None. That means those bones have been dead for a long time. And if there's no marrow there, that means no white blood cells are being produced. That means that the immune defenses are down and any invader can come in. Are you with me now? Amen. God's talking about bones. We need to talk about bones. As in the literal, so in the spiritual. And where are these bones located? Come on now, talk to me. Brothers and sisters, just stop for a second. Just act like you're alive. Because when you go home, I know you're not going to act like this. I hear you in the hallway jumping around talking. Y'all talk a whole bunch of nonsense in the fellowship hall. Talk some truth with me right now. Is that okay? Amen. Look at you, I'm going to say amen. Say amen. 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 Have mercy. <laughs> Father in heaven, please be with us. The enemy does not want us to be engaged in your word. I know that you want us to be a thinking people. Help us to think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, where were the bones located? In a valley. Where do you find valleys? On the top of mountains. Between what? Between two mountains. Am I telling the truth? Amen. So these bones that were void of life and void of defense, they were found in a valley. They were found betwixt two mountains. What are mountains a symbol of in the Bible? Mountains can stand as a symbol of various things in Bible prophecy. I want you to see one. Are you with me right now? Go with me. Matter of fact, I'll go to some place that's familiar to you. Go with me to the book of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, and you're going to verse 44. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. As you turn your Bible there, you remember in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had an image. Head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet, part of iron and part of clay. Then there was a stone that was cut out without hands that smote the image in its feet that of iron and clay and broke the whole image into pieces. Then that stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, the Bible gives us the interpretation of what that prophetic symbolism of the stone turning into a great mountain stands for. If you're with me, say amen. Verse 44 says, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and it shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms and shall stand forever. What was the mountain a symbol of there? Come on, talk to me. A what? Kingdom. I want you to see this truth once again in the Bible. We're turning your Bibles right now to Zechariah. Where are you going now? Zechariah. Zechariah. We're looking at the eighth chapter. We're looking at the symbolism of a mountain in the Bible. Zechariah, the eighth chapter, and I'm going now to verse three. Once again, we're looking at what a mountain can stand as a symbol of in Bible prophecy. Zechariah chapter eight, looking at verse three, the word of God says, thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts the holy mountain. So Jerusalem was identified as a mountain. Amen? 
Question, was Jerusalem a kingdom, yay or nay? I ask again, was Jerusalem a kingdom, yes or no? Yes, the answer is yes. Brothers and sisters, so a mountain in the Bible can stand as a symbol of a what? A kingdom. Why is this significant to what we're looking at in Ezekiel chapter 37? Where are these bones found, brothers and sisters? In the valley. Don't you get it? These are people that are between two kingdoms. They're neither good worldlings or good Christians. They're lukewarm, dead in their sins. It's Laodicea. And that's why, brothers and sisters, every manner of erroneous doctrine and error can find its way into the precincts of the church because we're void of the spirit. And so we can have every species of error march right through the front door. Spiritual formations doesn't have to march through the front door. We'll just put it right in our theological seminaries. Evangelical ministers doesn't have to march through the front door. We'll just put it on the shelves of our ABCs. Oh, don't start dancing in your seat now when I start talking about the truth. Because you know what I'm saying is a fact. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, God literally said this is our condition. Does he want this to be our condition? No. He doesn't want it to be our condition. Matter of fact, look at what God says to his servant in Ezekiel chapter 37, please. Ezekiel chapter 37, and I want you to go down with me to verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 37, looking at verse 3. The word of God says, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, the general conference knoweth. You don't get my point. And I said, and he said unto him, Son of man, can these dry bones live? And I said unto him, O oh Lord God, give me seven days. We'll have a board meeting. I'll let you know. When God presented to Ezekiel the condition of his people, and then he presents the inquiry to Ezekiel. Can these dry bones live? Ezekiel, the prophet of God, realizes the deplorable condition of the people of God. And he can see it is beyond humanity to remedy the condition of the church. Hence, he puts the onus on the shoulders of the only one who can remedy the condition. O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Are you with me right now? Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. If you see things going on in a church that you don't like, I'm going to tell you, there is not one man in this church there's not one position in this church that is invested with enough authority and power to remedy what's going on in this church. Did you hear what I just said? There is not a man, a council, a union, or a division, or all collectively that can remedy the condition that's in the church. So why are you blaming all these men and unions and divisions and conferences and systems? when they need life just as much as we do. Amen. Bible says, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Who do we need to be making our plea to? The God of heaven. Amen. And as Ezekiel accurately responds to the inquiry of Jehovah, Look at how God responds to his servant back in verse chapter 37, looking at verse 4. The Bible says that God says to his servant Ezekiel, again he said, unto, said unto me, 
prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And I love verse seven. So I prophesied. As I commanded, as I was commanded. The man of God received the word of God and he declared the word of God exactly as he had received it. He did not diminish one jot or tittle of the word that God gave him to deliver to his people. He didn't say, hold on a second, that's a little bit, let me water it down a little bit. Because that part's just not politically correct. If I say that, Lord, every woman in the church is going to hate me. They will all hate me, Lord. Surely if I say this, they're not going to vote me into position next year. It's just not going to happen. Brothers and sisters, Ezekiel, the servant of God, gave no thought as to what the repercussions might be for declaring the word of the Lord. Why? Because he was given the word of the Lord by the Lord, and so all he could do was declare what? The word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. The devil has done a good job in deceiving us into political correctness. God never called us to be politically correct. He called us to be correct. Amen? Amen. He called us to speak the truth. If Jesus was politically correct, the Bible would read entirely different from the way we read it now. They would have never shouted, crucify him. The man of God and the woman of God that the Lord is looking for in this hour is one that he can put his words into your mouth and know that you will speak that which he has given you to speak. And as he prophesied, not as he considered it would be good to prophesy. But as he prophesied, as he was commanded, something took place. The Bible says, And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. As he declared the word of the Lord exactly as God gave it to him. Because man's word does not possess life. God's word possesses life. I've gone some places and say, why do you have to quote so many scriptures? Because God's word has life. Amen. My words don't possess life. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. When he, spake, think, when he speaks, things are done. So he gave the word of the Lord. And as he gave the word of the Lord, what begins to happen? The bones begin to shake. And the bones come together, bone to their bone. You know, it's interesting. Before all of that transpires, the Bible says first when he prophesied, there was a noise. And then there was a shaking. You know, when you look at that word noise, in the original language, it gives this sense to mean that there was a crying that went forth in a loud fashion. Hold on a second. Has God told us that we should cry in a loud fashion? Isaiah chapter 58, looking at verse 1. Please turn your Bibles there. Isaiah chapter 58, looking at verse 1. The Bible tells us there, and you're all familiar with it. It says, cry aloud. 
Spear not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. Brothers and sisters, God says that he needs a people right now that will cry aloud and lift up their voices like a flute. Lift up your voice like a harp. Because we're going to be playing harps in heaven. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Brothers and sisters, I always like to talk about this issue because if I was, let's just say I was very skillful on the harp and you were in here right now. Let's just hypothetically say that you're in here right now under the influence of a food coma. Are you with me right now? And let's say that I just began to Lift up my voice like a harp, you know, like, you know, matter of fact, I just came in here strumming on my heart like David, you know, little David play on your heart. I was a master on the harp. And I come in here playing the harp. What are you going to do? You're going to go deeper into that coma, aren't you? What if I come piping on my flute? Playing Amazing Grace. We might have to do CPR to bring you back. I mean, you with me right now. You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? Brothers and sisters, that's not going to help you. The Bible says, lift up your voice like a... You know, I used to play the trumpet. If I fill up my diaphragm with ear and put my trumpet to your ear and let out a blast, you will wake up immediately and want to immediately know what is going on. Are you understanding the point? Do you realize that that is what God is trying to do to his church in this hour? And when God is calling us to lift up our voices like a trumpet, he does not simply say we need to lift up our voices like a trumpet and just say, brothers and sisters, happy Sabbath. I love you. He says, show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. What causes death? The wages of sin is why are the bones dry in the midst of the valley? Because they're in. So how are you going to remedy the condition of the bones? You have to deal with the sin in the church. The sin has to be dealt with. And it has to be dealt with straightway. Do you realize there is a specific reason why God is calling us to lift up our voices like a trumpet? Why? Go with me to the book of Revelation. Where are you going now? Come on now. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, John the Revelator was on the Isle of Patmos. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1 that as John was in the spirit on the Lord's day, Looking at verse 10, it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a what? Saying I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Hold on a second. Who's this speaking right here? Jesus Christ. Who possesses the voice that sounds like a trumpet? Jesus himself. Why is it significant? Go with me to the book of John chapter 5. Where are you going now? The bot- Where are you going now? John chapter 5, John chapter 5, and we're looking at the 25th verse. John chapter 5, looking at the 25th verse. Look what the Bible says about the voice of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, that sounds like the utterances of a trumpet. The word of God says in verse 25 of John chapter 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, that sounds like a what? That sounds like a what? Trumpet. And they that hear shall live. Now, do you understand why God is saying lift up your voice like a trumpet? Because it's only the voice of the trumpet that can bring the dead to life. When Jesus is calling us to lift up our voices like a trumpet, he is literally calling us to be recipients of his spirit that he might work through us to speak to his 
people that the dead might live. Brothers and sisters, if you don't believe it, I'm going to just say it like this straight way. Any minister, any elder, any brother or sister that is a part of the church that refuse to deal with the sin that is in the church, they do not love you. Let me say it in clearer language. Any minister, any elder, any brother or sister that refuses to deal with sin in the church in the love of Christ, the spirit of Christ is not in them. How do I know that? Because Jesus himself says in Revelation chapter 3, all that I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent in this hour. Jesus knows that the, the only remedy for Laodicea is the voice of the trumpet. Because we're dead. And we need to be quickened to come to a point of sensibility to realize, yes, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, we have a high priest that is touched with the feelings of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And we can therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Yes, all of these things. But brothers and sisters, God will have no portion with the sinner. And until we realize that our sin, our sin separates us from God. We're not going to begin dealing with that sin. We'll continue to comfort ourselves and believe God knows he knows I love him. Come on, God's not really going to keep me out of heaven for this. God's not really going to kick Adam. God's not really going to kick Adam and Eve out of the garden for eating a fruit. It's not really going to have all of creation begin dying because a woman eats a fruit off a tree and then a man eats it. It's not really going to make a priest drop down dead because he touches the side of an ark. You think sin is a little thing. Look at the cross. Come back and give me a new opinion on, your, on, your, on what sin is. If sin would send God to the cross, sin isn't a joke. And you know something? We've heard this so often. Oh, Jesus died on the cross for us. The Son of God died on the cross for us. So much so that it, it, it's, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it's, it means almost nothing to us. It's just like a, it's like a commercial jingle. But when this great controversy comes to an end, and the heavens roll back, and all the angelic host ushers Jesus Christ into the atmosphere of planet Earth as he rides upon a cloud of fire that enfolds within and without, and then he looks upon you with eyes that are like lamps of fire. In that moment of time, you will realize that you had a totally wrong estimate upon whom God was. And it will be too late. It's a serious thing. He said, Brother Chris, why are you preaching fire and brimstone? You know, the prophet said, some save with fire. For some time, I really believe that some of us need some fire to wake up. Because everything is good until everything's not good. You know what I'm talking about, right? Everything's looking good. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You, you know how we are? Everything is good. The bills are being paid. The money's rolling in. You go to the doctor. You're diagnosed with cancer. And all of a sudden, you're the prayer warrior in church. Because everything is good until you realize it's not good. Brothers and sisters, everything's not okay. Sin separates man from God. 
And if I cling to my sin and you cling to your sin, we're never going to find our way into the courts of heaven. Can these dry bones live? Yes, they can live. If we would simply listen to the voice of the trumpet that's telling us it is time to turn away from our selfishness. It is time to turn away from our idols. It's time to surrender the sin. And let Jesus Christ come in and reign within our hearts. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God's going to finish this work. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. The end will come and God is looking to awaken and bring about a revival and reformation within the church that will rise us up as a mighty army that will go forth into this world to give the final proclamation of the everlasting gospel and to proclaim the final downfall of Babylon. He's going to have a people that will accomplish this work. The prophecy is on the books. The mouth of God declared it. The question simply is, will you be on the right side of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Now, can I speak straight with you? Because I'm going to. When the invitation was given today for the people of God to go out and share the great controversy, everyone should have been here. I don't want to hear. Everyone should have put in their hands. Don't tell me your feet hurt. I've had people stand on the corner with walkers working with me. I've had people go out with canes working with me. I've gone, I've gone out with people that are double, I might think triple my age, working. Brothers and sisters, we need to stop making excuses. Think about it. If you're going to die, wouldn't you rather die on the battlefield than die in your bed? If this work is going to be completed, it's either going to be through you or those stones that God is getting ready to make cry out. Ain't no stone taking my crown. You heard the testimony. I like to speak very straight. You heard the testimony that Brother Sepien gave today. How many of you heard that testimony? He said that was it was like supernatural. Brothers and sisters, it's actually natural. It's naturally what God will do when we give ourselves into his hand. We get to see the supernatural when we choose to follow the will of God. When you say, Lord, I surrender for your will to be accomplished in my life, then if God's will is going to work through you, then what are you going to see? Supernatural things. Because God is super. There are multitudes of people out there that are right now praying and asking for God to send his truth to them. And you're literally handcuffing God because you're supposed to be his hands and feet. Have you ever been handcuffed before? I would like to tell you that I haven't had that experience. But I've, I would be lying because I've had it on multiple occasions. When you're handcuffed, it's one of the most disturbing feelings because immediately as those handcuffs go on you, you can literally feel the freedom, the, the, the sense of freedom just leave you. The sense of freedom just leaves you. And if there's an itch that you want to scratch, whew, if you're not double jointed, Lord have mercy on you. Think about what I'm saying. You want to do it, you want to do it, you want to do it. As soon as those handcuffs come off, what do you do? You straight, you go straight way to what you had in your mind to do all that time. Oh, I got to scratch here, I got to put my pot. 
God is trying to reach people. We are his hands and we are his feet. But the difference between intelligent creation and inanimate creation, when God gives his word to inanimate creation, it has to immediately obey. Tree, let there be two branches. Immediately, two branches. Dog, two heads, guess what that's going to be? Two heads. Sun stop shining, darkness. Man, be obedient, you have a choice. The same word that brought the son into existence is the same word that he presents to you when he says, go ye therefore. Has the same power. The difference is you have the choice as to whether or not the power of God will be revealed in your life. When we choose to obey, we get to see the power of God. That's what Brother Sapien was talking about. Sapien was talking about. He said, man, this is amazing. Because this person was praying, and then I came to them, and I gave them a book. And this person was, and I... Because God was dying to reach those people. And by making the right choice to yield to the will of divinity, the hands of God were unleashed, and he was able to touch them. God is doing marvelous things in this world even now. But we have to make these choices. It's all of us in this place. I'll share with you just a couple of testimonies and I'll close in prayer. Is that okay? I want to end this on a very practical note. Is that all right? I don't know if I shared this testimony with you before, but I love the testimony. So I'll share it again. I was in the island of Fiji not too long ago. I was doing some evangelistic meetings out there in the, island, in the capital city of Suva. As I was having my morning devotions one day, the Spirit of the Lord came to me and told me, Chris, I want you to go out and I want you to go talk with the people in the community. I want you to share flyers with them, share some DVDs with them, invite them to come to the meetings. I was impressed to do this. And so that morning I left with my, well, that afternoon, I left with my wife and my daughter. We went down the street to run some errands and I talked to a shop owner and talked to her about the meetings and I prayed with her and and etc, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But that was the end of my missionary ventures for that day. Are you following right now? But I was a little satisfied in myself. Well, I did it. The next morning I had my devotions. The impression came back, but it came back stronger than the previous day. I could not. I could not shake that conviction. I said, Lord, I'm sorry that I was not fully faithful to what you convicted me to do yesterday. I will be obedient today. And so that morning I got up, I had a little breakfast, I put some leaflets in a bag, I put some DVDs in the bag, and as I stepped out of the door, I got onto the street and I prayed and I said, God be with me, lead me and direct me for your will to be done. And then every person that I met, I introduced myself to them, found out what their name was, told them about the meetings, but I encouraged them that if they had not done so already, to give their hearts to Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior because he was coming soon and we needed to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I asked them, would they allow me to pray with them? And so I went from bus stop to bus stop. I began to go from business to business. Business owners literally stopped their businesses, got their employees together and had me pray with all of them together. It was a blessing. And I remember there was this young man as I stepped out of this one um, pharmacy I saw this young man getting ready to get on a bus, but he missed the bus, and I was impressed he missed the bus because he needed to meet up with me. And so I went and I talked with the young man, did what I did with all of the other previous engagements with individuals, and as we finished praying, we opened our eyes, and there was this car that pulled up. Evidently, the driver knew the young man, so he was able to get a ride to go to his destination. So I was happy to see this young man got into the car, and I went, I went forward to carry out my mission. I went into a parking lot that was nearby, and I began to talk with some cab drivers that were there. But as I was talking with these cab drivers, that car that picked up that young man, it did a little U-turn in the street and turned around and came into that parking lot. And then the driver began to flash his headlights. And I was thinking to myself, well, he must be trying to get the attention of these taxi drivers until I realized he was trying to get my attention because all of a sudden he yelled out of the window, Chris. 
Now I'm across the planet right now. I walked over to the car and he said, Chris. I said, yes. He said, get in. Now I'm from New York. You're just going to tell me to get in the car. <laughs> he tells me, get in. And furthermore, I'm in Fiji. I don't know if you know the Fijian people, but they're not a, they're, they're sizable people. Are you with me so far? And he happened to be quite on the very sizable side. <laughs> and so I'm looking at everybody inside of the vehicle. But I remembered I prayed and I said, Lord, lead me and direct me. I said, OK, I'll get in. And I got into the back of the car and he said, listen, I need to talk to you. I got to drop off this young man. And he had about three young men in the car. I have to drop off this young man and this young man. Listen, I'll drop you off where you live, where you're staying at. I need to talk with you. Will you come with me? I said, OK, let's go. So we start driving down the road. And then he says to me, last night, my wife and my daughter and myself were watching you on the Internet. I don't know this guy for that. I'm in Fiji. And he said, and I'm driving down the street. And I said, oh, that's the guy we were watching on the Internet last night. He said, would you come home with me and preach to my family? I said, sure. So he jumps on the phone and he puts it on the intercom and his daughter picks up the phone and he says, you'll never guess who I have in the car. She said, who? You know the guy we were watching on the Internet last night? She said, yeah. He said, he's in the car here with me right now. She said, no way. I said, hey, how you doing? She said, no way. <laughs> he said, get the birthday cake and tea ready. He's coming home to preach to us. <laughs> he drives me to his his residence. He has a farm. He has workers on the plantation. He calls the workers off the plantation. He calls the family members out the house. There's a good group of individuals, about 15, 20 people. And then they all gather together under this small edifice, this small structure, I should say, that they have out there on his property. And then when everybody gathered under that little structure and they all sat down on the ground, as it is their tradition, he then looked at me and said, OK, they're all here. Preach. Those are his exact words. And so I prayed. I'm telling you the truth. So I prayed. And then I began to speak. And for the next 10, 15 minutes, I, I preached that which God placed upon my heart and I made an appeal. And after I finished the sermonette, so to say, the gentleman looked at me and he said, what do you have to do for the rest of the day? Now, remember, I'm there to conduct some evangelistic meetings at the, at, at the conference center. But I'm curious what he has in mind. So I said, what, what, what do you have in mind? He said, I want to take you to different places on the island to do 15 minute preaching appointments. Will you go with me? Remember, I prayed. I said, let's go. We jump in the car. We start driving. He gets on the phone. A man picks up the phone. He says, I have an evangelist here in the car with me from the United States of America. Get the campers together. He's coming over to preach. He says, do you mind driving about 45 minutes with me? I said, sure, no problem. Let's go. So we drive out of the city, into the suburbs, into the country, into the jungle. <laughs> we go to a place called Dawasamu. And then we get to this place and then there's a man that comes out from the bushes. And there was a gate and he opens this gate and he drives me onto this property. Where am I going? Brothers and sisters, they were having a youth camp for young people from across the island from different Sunday denominations. And they begin to come out of the different structures and they're all coming, sitting down on the grass. They have children from from age five all the way up to thirty five. And they're all coming out and they're sitting down on the grass and they're sitting down. And as everybody gets there and they all sit down, then he looks at him. He says, everybody's here. Preach. And so I prayed and I began to preach. And as I was preaching, the spirit of the Lord begins to prick me and says, share with them Daniel chapter two. I said, Lord, no, I can't share with them Daniel chapter two right now. Share with them Daniel chapter two. I'm preaching. But in my mind, I'm having this back and forth with God. Oh, Daniel chapter 2. I don't have time for Daniel chapter 2 right now. Share with them Daniel chapter 2. But I, 
they're not going to get... Share with them Daniel. I don't have a Daniel chapter 2 statue. I thought that was the end all with God right there, right? I don't have a Daniel chapter 2 statue, God. I have to illustrate it to them. Then the Spirit of the Lord brings it to my attention once again that the gentleman that drove me there was a quite sizable man. <laughs> because he was the previous coach for the Fijian rugby team. And you know rugby is huge in that part of the world. So he turned into my Daniel chapter 2 statue. Head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly. I go through all of Daniel chapter 2, bring them down to the merging of the union of church and state, the introduction of the Sunday law, the importance of the commandments of God, the Sabbath. We go through all of these things and then we say amen. We say the closing prayer. And then the person that was responsible for facilitating the camp stand, stood up and very formally thanked me for coming and then began to tell me that during the whole time that they were at that camp, these five-year-olds all the way up to 35, do you know what they were doing? They were fasting and praying. This is a youth camp. Fasting and praying. And he said to me, this is confirmation. This was an answer to our prayers. And as I was driving from that camp, I wanted to cry because I was thoroughly convicted that God is trying to finish the work, but we have to be willing to be obedient and do the work. Brothers and sisters, God is trying to reach people high and low rich and poor, free and bond. All he is looking for is willing men and women to do the work. Final testimony. I was in the island of Vanuatu. It's in the South Pacific as well. Very late at night. This is a very interesting island because some of you might be familiar with it, but there's a narcotic that they like to partake in called betel nut. Ever heard of that before? When you chew on this thing called betel nut, it turns your mouth red, it turns your lips red like you've been eating people. So literally, if you don't know what it is, and you just came to that island and you saw these people, you'd really think that this was an island of cannibals. I mean, literally. Their mouth, their teeth are red, it's just like they were just, con they look like vampires. Go ahead, take a look at it on the internet and you'll see that I'm not exaggerating. And it's prevalent. It's just massive. And so I finished. I actually came to the end of the meetings that we were doing in Vanuatu. It was late at night, very dark. You know, they don't have any street lights or anything of that nature in those vicinities. And as we were just kind of having a little fellowship meal or something of that nature, I don't remember what it was. There was a gentleman that came over to me and he said, I would like to take you to go and meet someone. Will you come with me? And so I said, okay, I'll come. Let me go tell my wife that I'll be leaving and then we can go. And so I went. My wife was staying in this like little hut structure and I told her that I'm going to go to meet somebody. I don't know, but I'll be back soon. Came back and the man said, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. We jumped into his Jeep and we began to drive down this dark road. As we were driving down the dark road, I looked over at him and I said, so, so where are we going? And he says nothing. And he continues to drive. So obviously I'm thinking to myself, maybe I didn't speak loud enough. He didn't hear me. So I, I waited a moment or two. I said, so, so where are we going? And he didn't say anything. At this point, I'm looking at the fact that I'm in the middle of nowhere. It's extremely dark. I'm driving in this car with this man that I don't know. And now I'm praying that the Lord cleanse me of all of my sins because if my hour has come. <laughs> I said to him once again, where are we going? Still no answer. We literally drive 
for 20 minutes and he does not respond to where are we going. He finally says to me, we're going to see the prime minister. He said he's been going through some issues. There's a controversy that's going on. And I told him that I would like to bring you by to pray for him. So now we're on our way to go see the prime minister. I said Vanuatu, forgive me, Solomon Islands. We get to his compound where he stays and the, 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 the soldiers are there. They come in, they know the gentleman that's driving. They lifted the gate to let him into the compound. And then he parks the car and he says, wait here, I'll come back for you. He goes inside of the prime minister's house. And then I'm sitting in the car for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, two hours. It's almost, we, it goes from 9 o'clock and now it's almost 12 o'clock. Are you with me now? I'm sitting in the car. At this point, I say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm sitting here in this car. I don't even know why you have me sitting here in the prime minister's compound. I had no idea I'm going to see the prime minister. I said, Lord, if I don't, if you haven't given me any words to say to this man, then don't let me go in there. But if you're going to put your words in my mouth, then open the door for me to go and speak on your behalf. 25 minutes later, the gentleman comes out and he says, it's time to go in. He says, they've been arguing and I've been trying to wait until it all settles down. But they're ready for you now. I walked inside the door and you can see the prime minister with, the, with his picture with the head of the UN, Kofi Annan, and with di various different leaders of different nations and the president of the United States of America and all these things. And then I walked into the room where the prime minister was and some different officials and you could clearly see that there was extreme tension in the room. Have you ever been in one of those situations before? That it was so thick you could cut it? There was clear anger in the faces of the people. And... I went, I was escorted to a seat, and then the gentleman that brought me there introduced me to the prime minister. This is Christopher Hudson from the United States, you know, goes through his all. And he says, he's here to pray for you, but I know before he prays, he has a few words that he'd like to share. And so all this, all this is going on, I'm praying in my mind, Lord, please be with me, help me, teach me. And then when it was my time, I opened my mouth and I began to speak. And I spoke the words the Lord placed in my mouth. And I began to share with those in the room the seriousness of the times in which we live. How close we are to the loosing of the four winds. The critical issue of the commandments of God and how these individuals that are in very important positions to make decisions that direct the course of a nation and thereby impact the lives of people that are under their governing, they have a weighty responsibility before God that they will, be, that they will come into judgment before God if they do not make decisions as led by the Almighty God. And as I was sharing with them, you could see how the Spirit of God began moving on their hearts and faces that were turned to the wall began to turn and look in my face and eyes began to open up. And then I said a prayer and shortly thereafter I left. Brothers and sisters, I knew in that space of time when I had that opportunity, it wasn't because I was special. It was just because I was willing. It's just because I was getting up in the morning and studying my Bible and seeking to commune with God and I was willing. 
and just and God grabbed what was closest to him and he used it. God wants to use all of us. Be it speaking a word, saying a prayer, or sharing a book, he wants to use us and he needs to use us, brothers and sisters. Are you willing to be used by God? If God's going to use you, the first thing we have to do is surrender. But once you surrender, supernatural, that will become your natural. And that's what God designs for his people. So if I leave you with one thought, I leave you with this. Give your heart to Jesus. Allow the Lamb of God to cleanse you of your sin. And then simply follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may God use you for his glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are nothing but clay. We're just dust. The only reason, Lord, we're special because you made us. We're special because you made us in your image and we're even more so special because you died for us. But forgive us for not realizing the great love that you have shown towards us. Forgive us for keeping ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for refusing to yield ourselves into your hands. Our prayer this night, as the new week has begun, is that your fear would be in our hearts, that your glory would be revealed through our lives, that your will will be accomplished in these earthen vessels. Have thine own way. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And as we leave your courts, may your spirit continue to rest upon each one of us until he fills us and we are sealed in you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.